Philippians 3, verses 17 to 21. If you have your Bibles, if you could turn with me. Philippians 3, verses 17 to 21. If you don't have your Bibles, you can look on screen, but that's okay. Philippians 3, 17 to 21, where the Lord says this. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again with tears, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Amen. So, first question. Who here likes to eat? Raise your hand if you like to eat. As most of you, those that aren't raising your hand, you're probably lying. Everyone <laughs> likes to eat. Come on, seriously. Um, you know, of course, different people like to eat different things, but in general, like, come on. Like, in, in terms of, of your moments of happiness, they kind of often have to center around food. Maybe even I'm simple like that. <laughs> but, you know, for me, you know, good food makes me happy. Now, bad food, of course, brings much misery and pain. <laughs> but good food brings out joy, it brings happiness. So, you know, most of us, I believe, like to eat. Um, you turn to, I think I have a couple questions. Next one, please. You guys are stomach grumbles. Who likes to eat? All right, so, have you ever felt like you're controlled by your stomach? <laughs> okay. When is the worst time to ever go shopping for groceries? When you're hungry. When you're hungry. Right, why is that? Why is it a bad idea to go shopping when you're hungry? That's right. Everything looks a little... <laughs> and next thing you know, your cart is full of stuff that you don't really need, but stuff that you want to consume at that very moment. Right? And you come home and you, know, you start unloading your groceries and you're like, why did I buy all this? Was I really that hungry? <laughs> like, <"Ooh." laughs> anyway, so there, there are times when we feel controlled by our stomach. And it can actually dictate how we do certain things. Now, now, who of you, if you get hungry, it actually affects your mood? Right, raise your hand if you get kind of grumpy when you're hungry. Right, some of you are being honest, all right? Um, yeah, a lot of you are being honest. All right, so, so you know, and, and especially for us, we, we tend to be like creatures of routine, right? And so if we, if we don't eat at a certain time, oh, no. <laughs> if, if we're eating 30 minutes later, you know, we're not happy. We're upset. We're, 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 we're throwing things at people, right? Um, and so we can often find that our, our stomach tends to, to affect our own moods, our own emotions, how we act, right? our behaviors. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? How this little thing can be so powerful. Now, you know, if you're continuing along this, you know, the passage talks about how their God is their stomach. And that's really kind of what I'm keying in on right now. What it means when when your, your stomach is actually your God, when, when you're actually being led by your stomach. And many times you'll see that, if you, if you flip to the next one, that, that really being led by your stomach is giving in to an immediate need. Something that you want at that moment. Something that, that looks appealing to you at that very instant. That is, that is kind of what it means to, to be led by your stomach. You see something, you want to. You're hungry, you want to satisfy that hunger. There's an immediate need, an immediate want. It's living in that very present moment. Now what's the end result? If, if you actually gave in to your stomach and, and just, you know, was dictated by it all the time, what, what's the end result of all of that? 
You eat whenever you want. You eat whatever you want. What happens? Get fat. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm the living sermon illustration. <laughs> uh, what happens when you let your stomach go out of control? So, um, for myself personally, I always had a little bit down here. Um, but at the same time, believe it or not, I used to exercise in America. And, and then, you know, I came to Korea, found it a little bit more difficult. Actually, first of all, when I first came to Korea, I lost a lot of weight. The reason why is because if you only take the subway, you walk a lot. Right? Subway station is not close to anything. Right? And so you're walking a lot, and then you're transferring, and you're, tran you know, you end up walking probably a good hour and a half, two hours a day. And then you get smart, you learn the bus system. <laughs> and you never walk again. <laughs> so, um, being a slave to the bus system and, and you know, that, that, that ability to minimize the amount of walking, um, I remember a couple of years ago, I've always had, had a little bit right here, but then all of a sudden, this top part showed up. I said, ooh, where are you? You're new. <laughs> Where'd you come from? <laughs> and, and I see, you know, it's just like, you know, I, I look in the mirror, I'm like, I look like a pregnant woman. <laughs> How did this happen? How do I get rid of this? And, and you know, yeah, I'm, I'm almost worried that I'm a lost cause. Every time I go to the doctor, they're like, you're obese. You're gonna die soon. <laughs> basically, every every doctor you go to in Korea basically tells you you're overweight, um, whether it's true or not. They told my cousin that also, and he's, he's not really that heavy. Um, regardless, yeah, it's not bad. All right, so um, that's, that's what you see. The end result of giving in to immediate wants and immediate needs is generally that it, it leads to a lot of negativity. Now to continue, um, and this is kind of funny. This wasn't this wasn't a prepared sermon illustration, but this past Friday night, I went to a Mercado. It's a it's a Brazilian steakhouse here in Korea. Um, it's in the Cheongdam area. Um, if you haven't had Brazilians, you know, if you haven't been to Brazilian barbecue, they bring out meat on a skewer, right? And then they just keep giving you meat, right? And they give you different kinds of meat, and then if you you, you pick what kind of meat you want, and they, they keep bringing it out. Unfortunately, Ricardo, they, they took their time. <laughs> if you go to nice Brazilian barbecues, they're like right up on you, and they got like like five skewers in your face, like, oh, would you like some meat? And so, <laughs> yeah, they're basically shoving meat down your throat, normally. Now, Mercado is, is honestly one of the better ones in Korea. It's from quality, that's why we went there. And so we went there, um, Apparently, I'm housing a bunch of refugees, and so they felt bad, so they decided to feed me. So, they took myself and my cousin to Mercado, and we're eating. And, and of course, when I see this delicious meat, my stomach says, feed me. <laughs> my stomach says, now. <laughs> and so I eat it. It's delicious. And I keep eating it. And, and my stomach doesn't really tell me to stop. <laughs> and so we keep going, and you know, when, when it comes to buffets, for myself, I, I've kind of shied away from buffets. When I was in college, buffets were king. Because when you're a poor college student, it's all about quality. You don't care about the I mean, not, not, it's quantity, not quality, right? So it's bang for the buck. How much food you can get at minimal cost. So, so buffets were king when I was in college. You know, when I became a working adult, I was like, you know what? I got money. Well, I don't need to eat buffets anymore. And so I started eating the fancy stuff. But anyway. This is like a fancy buffet, so you get nice food for like, you know, all you can eat, whatever. So, I'm eating all this meat, and um, you know, there's always that pride thing too, because you know, for me, I'm like, I never want to be the last one to give up. Right? I gotta be the buffet king, right? So my cousin, he was the, we were going head to head, and, and I, I, I went one notch over him, right? Anyway, afterwards, we fulfilled our immediate desires for probably about an hour. <laughs> Immediately afterwards, we had to walk back to the subway, and every step was pain <laughs> because there was this large mass inside of me that wasn't there before. I think I started to understand what pregnancy was like. <laughs> so I was taking steps, and I'm feeling my body stretch in ways that aren't natural. And then we're going up a hill, and I turn to my cousin, and we're both having trouble breathing. <laughs> 
<laughs> with <laughs> <laughs> and so we had an immediate reaction to, to filling our immediate needs. So like, we automatically regretted it. We're like, that last plate, you know what? I'm just gonna let that go. <laughs> and, and, and the funny thing is, because this was a meat buffet, right? Like meat is a very, like, you know, you got protein, it, it's difficult to break down. Not only did we regret it immediately afterwards, the next day, we're like, oh, why am I so tired? <laughs> I ended up taking a, a nap the next day just because I, I just, I, I didn't have any energy. My body was still breaking down all this protein that it consumed. So, what does that show you? Don't eat too much meat. <laughs> no, it, it shows you really the end result of when we give in to those immediate desires, those immediate wants all the time. Is that it's actually leading us astray. Now back when I was a first year in seminary a few years ago, one, one of the things that I was challenged with, there, there were actually quite a few challenges, but one of the ones that I really took to heart was fasting. Now, I came from a background in church where we didn't really fast. Um, and, and so fasting to me was a very foreign thing. I didn't really understand, why would you choose not to eat? I was like, well, what's the point of that? I mean, you know, is, does that really make you more holy? Like, you know, everybody needs to eat. And so I, I didn't really take fasting to heart growing up. I remember the first time I was challenged to fast was actually when I was a working adult. And when I was a working adult, the cool thing was that among my coworkers, many of them were believers, and one of them was a very devout Presbyterian, and um, it was actually Good Friday, so we're at work, and I was like, hey, Robert, you want to get some lunch? He's like, oh, no, I'm fasting today. I was like, oh, all right, see you later. <laughs> um, but he, he just kind of told me, like, it was his annual routine to fast on Good Friday. I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, so I actually gave it a shot. Um, the next year, the following year, and I challenged, at the time I was, I was leading a young girl group, I challenged them to join me. And for me, that was actually the first time I ever really fasted. And um, I was surprised, because I was like, man, I know my body. I know that, like, right at 11.30, I'm gonna get hungry, because we always ate at 11.30. We are like clockwork, 11.30. So I was like, man, I'm gonna get to the day. And, and then the day goes by, and I, I felt like, I felt strangely satisfied. Like, because I, I kind of committed that day to the Lord, I didn't really feel any hunger pains. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, I went through the whole day, no problem. And so, that's kind of how I started to fast. And I started doing that every year on Good Fridays. When I was in seminary, I would study about church history, and you would see these traditions of people that would go on very long fasts, very frequently, especially monks. I was like, well, what's the point of this? And so I was like, you know what? I have friends who do this. Why don't I give it a shot? And so that's when I started juice fasting, uh, where you just you know, drink juice. And, and I decided to do that for a week. And I was a bit worried, too. Again, I was like, man, yeah, I can do one day, but you know, a week's kind of crazy. And so as I started to fast, and, and really, the point of fasting, honestly, isn't just to deprive yourself of food. Um, what you're really supposed to be doing is, with that, with that extra time that you're having, is to actually spend more time in prayer. And so I would spend this time in prayer and feel strangely nourished. And as, as the, the fast would continue on, um, you know, I, I never felt hunger pains. Granted, there's some weird stuff that goes on in your body, <laughs> for those of you that have fasted before. There's weird stuff that kind of, you know, poison that kind of leaves your body too. It's, it's, it's not a pretty thing <laughs> for at least those first few days. Regardless, I'm going through it and I was really surprised. And I was like, wow, all my life I've been dictated by my stomach and I've been consuming so many different things and yet I'm not having a problem functioning. I was a little bit tired, honestly, but at the same time, it wasn't really affecting what I needed to do. My body really doesn't need as much as I consume, and it really doesn't require all these things that I feel are necessary. And, and as I would spend time in prayer, you know, during the time when I would normally eat, I started to recognize that because I wasn't dependent on, on regular food, I wasn't spending time eating, and I wasn't self-nourishing myself, I guess. 
I actually felt spiritually that I was being put into a position of prayer. And that, for me, honestly, prayer doesn't come naturally. And so for me, those times when I fast, like, it comes a lot more natural. Because all of a sudden, I'm recognizing that I'm not depending on myself to feed myself, but I'm actually coming before God and asking Him to give me strength, asking Him to help me during this time. And I find myself in a physical and spiritual posture of prayer. And so if you've never fasted before, you know, I, I do recommend considering it. Um, and just being in that, that regular practice of, of placing yourself in a posture of prayer. Um, and I think as a church, you know, we'll, we'll try to do this occasionally as a church to fast together, really encourage each other through this and to really seek to, to increase our intimacy with God um, through these types of practices. But the, what that taught me really was that as much, like it really taught me how much I depended on my stomach and how much I depended on consuming different things. But in reality, I didn't have to. But in reality, God could provide more than that. So, um, to go back to the passage, flip to the next one, please. Um, now, the passage just before this, when you know we talked about how how nothing compares to knowing Christ. Paul speaks out against a group that's called the Judaizers. It's people that were basically adding rules to have a relationship with God. And what we learned last week is that those extra rules, those different things, don't actually give us intimacy with God. Now flip to the next one, please. Now what he's talking about this time is there's another group of people within the church. They're kind of known as the Libertines. And what they were saying is, you know what? We have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with Jesus. He's forgiven us. We're saved. That means we can do whatever we want. <coughs> and basically, they're like, you know what? You know, we can sin because you know, the grace of God is great enough to overpower that sin. So let's just sin and enjoy our lives. So they're basically just giving in the pleasure under the name of Christ. That's the group that, that Paul is speaking out against in this particular passage. That's why he's saying their God is their stomach. Their eyes are focused on earthly things. You know, back then, Roman culture, as we talked about before, was all about giving in to your pleasures. You know, gladiator, you're watching people basically kill each other. We got MMA now, haha, Korean zombie, right? <laughs> um, you, know, the, you know, Roman culture was all about filling your, your, your pleasures, right? Whether it's sexual, whether it's food, whatever it was. And in all honesty, I question how far away or how close we are to that even in modern society today. So when you look back at the early church, they struggled because there were two groups within the church that were saying different things. One group was saying, you know what, if you want to have a relationship with God, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. They were creating more rules. They were being very legalistic. And another group was saying, throw those rules out the window. There are no rules. You can do whatever you want. Jesus still loves you. Both are wrong. And in all honesty, we still wrestle with these issues in the church today. There are still people that, that, that tell us that in order to be saved, you have to do this, this, this. There are still people that say, you know what, I'm saved. I'm going to live the life I want to live. And Jesus will redeem that. And both aren't true. Next slide, please. Thankfully, God doesn't leave us on our own. Thankfully, He has placed people before us to set examples. He has placed people that, that, that can show us how to live properly. In this passage, Paul is appealing to himself. He's like, follow my example. In, in chapter 2, he talks about Timothy. He talks about Epaphroditus. He talks about people that they know. He's like, follow us. We are your examples. We, we like follow the people that are walking along the right pattern or along the, along the right way, right? And thankfully, God has done the same even for us. For all of us, there are there are people in our lives that we look up to. There are people in our lives that are doing the right things and that show us the right way. 
Now I've talked a lot about my family, so so you guys are, are, are relatively aware that that I have kind of a holy family. So there's a lot of examples just within my family. But but when I thought back about it, I have had some wonderful mentors in my life. Um, going back to my youth group, my first youth group pastor is actually he became one of my New Testament professors, Dr. Steve Chang. Um, he's, he's a teacher, he's a professor at uh, George Trinity right now. The next, Leo Ree, is, is actually going to be guest speaking here in a couple weeks. Um, he was the head pastor of, of OEM, Onlivi, um, for about another, for a couple of years. And um, now he's back in Korea. Um, you know, in, in terms of the English ministry that I was involved in in, in America, like Dave Gibbons was the leader of that, of that ministry, and he's actually leading this, this big mega church in, in California called New Song. And so when I look back at my spiritual heritage, I've been very blessed in that there, there are people that, that God has put in my life that have set amazing examples for me. And I don't think I'm alone. For all of you here, I think God has placed people in your lives to show you how to walk the right path. And there's a reminder that, that, that you know, as we, as we look to these people as we look to the example that's set before us. Paul gives us two reasons why to focus on these things. And, and the first, if you turn on the next side, is that our hope is in who we are. Our hope is in our identity. He calls us citizens of heaven. Now this was an important thing for the, for the Philippians because they took a lot of pride in their status as citizens of Rome. And then he even calls Christ Lord and Savior, which is actually what the emperor called himself, was Lord and Savior. So it's a stark reminder to the Philippians that, you know, you take such pride in being a Roman citizen, but in reality, you're not just a Roman citizen, you're a citizen of heaven. Now for us, that's something we also share. Whether we're Korean, whether we're from different countries, we got like, what, Vietnam, Philippines, um, Singapore, um, America, Canada. We've got all sorts of nations represented in this room alone. But one thing that we do share, if we believe in Jesus, we are all citizens of heaven. That's an identity that will never go away. And that's an identity in many ways that should be greater than whatever ethnicity or, or you know, country status that we might have. So follow me with, with, with a brief analogy. I'm not sure how this is going to go. But regardless, there are many in this room that aren't from Korea. I'm one of them. I'm American, right? <laughs> I come here. People might think I'm Korean briefly just because I'm ethnically Korean. But you look at my clothes. Um, the moment I open my mouth, if I, even if I'm speaking Korean, you know I'm not Korean. <laughs> right? And so no matter what, no one, very few people are going to mistake me for a Korean if they actually spend enough time with me here, right? I'm an American. And no matter what, that's, that's always going to be there in my mannerisms and how I act. I'm always going to stick out from a, like a, a typical Korean citizen because I'm different, just in my identity. You know, when, when I'm going through a door, I will hold a door open for someone. <laughs> And then I'll end up standing there for about 10 minutes because people, they just keep coming. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> Regardless, I give away who I am by my actions. And that's true for us here as well. If we're citizens of heaven, then who we are, how we act, is going to be unmistakably different from those who want. You can't remove that identity from yourself the moment you're in Christ. It's always with you. Now, an interesting thing going back to, to the whole mentor thing is, you know, for those of you that, that are either not from Korea or for those of you that are from Korea that have lived abroad, whether it's in America, Canada, wherever it might be, um, usually you weren't the first to go. There's usually somebody before you, right? Um, Sometimes you're the first, but I think most of the people in this room were not the first. There was someone you went before and they said, hey, you know, if you're not from Korea, like, they're like, hey, Korea's not so bad, why don't you come over, right? 
Um, for those of you that ended up in America, like, yeah, you know, there's stuff to do here. Why don't you come over to America, right? And um, it's an interesting analogy because I noticed this in, in, um, in seminary, is that, um, you know, I went to seminary here in Korea, but because it's in English, it's almost like going to seminary in another country. Because the Koreans there, they all bound, they all bind together, and they're like, oh, 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 oh. And so they're all like <laughs> huddling together, and they look at me like, and so like they're looking at me, they're like, oh, like, oh, it's so great that you can speak English, blah, 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 blah. And like kind of like ostracizing me, right? Um, but one of the things I noticed was that they would gather together, and every time there was an exam or a paper, all of a sudden they would be like, they would work together and like they would create like, you know, like study guides. And like they would find like papers that people wrote years ago, and they would like like you know combine them into this one book, and they would only share it with each other. I didn't get any of this, right? Um, but but I found that this is actually true in America, right? So my, my you know my friends who went to seminary in America, they're like, oh yeah, the Koreans did that at our school too. So basically, you know wherever you went, there would be like they would all study together, um, you know they would all follow their their sambes around. And um, you know they, they would teach them the ropes of like how to get settled in, you know where the Korean food is okay, and, and all these different things. And, and you know you would have this kind of system where where like life was made easier because of those that had come before you. Now, morally, some of the things might not be right. <laughs> There's a reason why you know. Koreans get knocked on for um, plagiarizing often. <laughs> but regardless, there's that heart, there's that desire of trying to help those that are going to come later. Right? And so, in the same way, number one, recognize what your identity is, who you are. You are a citizen of heaven. Yes, you might be Korean. Yes, you might be from, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, wherever it might be. Yes, that is who you are as well. But first and foremost, you are a citizen of heaven. This place here, we don't really belong. We're just kind of here for a little while. And as such, we follow the example of those people. Next slide, please. Our hope is also in Jesus Christ. Now, you know, there, there's another thing. We, we can all be united in understanding that we are all citizens of heaven, but we can all also be united in that there's one thing that all of us can hope for. You know, things might not work out in our lives, right? You know, you might not end up following that career path you wanted. You might not get married. You might not get whatever it might be. There might be things that you're looking forward to that might not happen, but there's one thing that we can all hope in. And one thing that we know is happening for sure, and that's Jesus coming back. And this king, this coming king, will make right everything that's wrong. This coming king will restore everything that's broken. And that's our hope. That's one thing we can agree on. And that's one thing that can just continue us to help look not at our immediate needs, but further on to the future, to that future hope. Next slide, please. So, let's not give in to the stomach, right? I don't want you guys to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Spiritually. <laughs> Physically, too. Come on, let's, let's, let's look good. <laughs> but let's not keep our eyes stuck on the present. Because honestly, as we do, it keeps us away from our relationship with God. The, like, you know, like I said, when I was fasting, the more that I, I realized I was satisfying myself and, and so, you know, supplying for myself, the more I recognized I wasn't depending on God. Next slide, please. We look to the future. We look to heaven. We look to the coming King. And our eyes are fixed on that. That doesn't mean that what's going on right now isn't important. Sure, if it is, it is. But really, what we really care about is what's to come. Now to go back to this, right? This living sermon illustration that I have before you. Um, 
I'm a terrible dieter or exerciser, right? But at the same time, for those that are actually good at it, there's a, a level of self-denial, right? Of choosing not to partake of certain things that I choose to, right? You know, eating fried chicken, whatever it is. I ate fried chicken with my cousin last night. Like, What's wrong with me? Anyway, there's a, there's a self-denial that happens because you're looking further ahead to something that's of more value. People that are, are, that are disciplined and good at, at dieting and exercise, they do it because they're looking to a future goal. They're looking at something that you know, they're, they're, they're striving to become rather than where they're at right now. Not the best analogy, but in the same way. That's how we're meant to live our lives. Not just stuck in the present, not just stuck in whatever satisfaction we're looking for in the moment. But we know there's something greater to come. That's where I always should be. I think I've proven my point. And I think at some point, this needs to go away. <laughs> Please pray for me. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you. We praise you. And um, we pray that, that we wouldn't be spiritual gluttons, Lord, in the sense of just giving in to, to the, the pleasures and, and, and whatever, Lord, whets our appetites, Lord. But help us to see that there are greater things, Lord, much more greater things, Lord, that, that we need to keep our eyes fixed on. Jesus is coming back. There is no doubt in our minds that He is coming back. So I pray, Lord, that we would live as those that know that their King is returning. And that we wouldn't get stuck in the here and now. So instead of, of listening to those, Lord, that, that, that tell us our relationship with God is something that needs to be earned, instead of, of, of listening to, to those that, that are telling us that, that, that we can do whatever we want, we can, we can seek whatever pleasure we desire, help us to follow those, Lord, that are walking the right way. I pray, Lord, that you would place more and more of those people in our lives, more and more mentors, Lord. People that we can just look towards and, and, and be encouraged, be blessed, and be challenged to live in such a way. So help us, Lord, to follow those that are walking towards you. And may we lead others, Lord that as they look upon our lives, that they would see an example worth following. Keep our eyes fixed on that heavenly future. And may you be glorified through that all. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray.